Oh, hey, it's you again. My name is Mike Gearhart. I'm the fleet supervisor. Welcome to a day in the life of fleet. We have a working fire. Smoke sugar from the second and first floor alpha side. Charlie, one additional medic unit. Confirm one victim trapped in the basement. On the wastewater plant. Six feet on three stories. Medium size commercial. I do have fire from the roof. Uh, here at Fleet, we take care of all South Metro's vehicles, anything from uh, the Snowcat to all of our engines, towers, brush trucks. Uh, let's go inside and take a little tour. This is our tool room. We have a bunch of specialty tools in our cabinets, um, all of our electronic diagnostic tools, and other specialty large tools. Uh, let's go check out the parts room. This is our parts room. So we stock enough parts to uh, rebuild valves. We have uh, a ton of electronic equipment. We have light bulbs for every different light in the fleet, which as you can imagine is a lot. Uh, we have wiper blades for just about everything. Uh, we have consumables. So this is all stuff that, you know, techs use during their, their day. Cleaners, sealers, um, WD-40, that's always a good one. As you can imagine, a fleet of this size, we go through a lot of batteries. So we have a shelf here, shelf here, and batteries stacked back here. We, we go through a ton of batteries here. I would say we're a, a very well stocked Napa. Um, we, we have parts from Napa, but we stock most of the stuff to complete our job without having to order it. So it's, it's, uh, we're very well stocked here. Uh, the challenge is getting, you know, obviously with the supply chain shortages and everything, we have, uh, you know, issues getting some parts, but I would say stocking something for every single vehicle in the fleet. You know, we have all different makes, models, uh, types of equipment. So it's, we really have to stock something for all of that. We have a lot of We share this building with uh, Douglas County Schools. Their fleet maintenance is on this side, ours is on this side, obviously. Uh, the shop tools we share, a couple of them. Um, you know, we have a pretty good working relationship with these guys, so we, you know, uh, share tools and supplies and stuff like that. So in this shop, we have eight bays. Currently, one bay is being used for construction, so we are down to seven bays. Uh, we have 10 technicians, so let's go check out the other shop. This is the bay being used for construction. They're redoing uh, bathrooms and showers to make it larger for academies, uh, putting in some new offices and a conference room back here for us. This is our break room and office supply storage.
this is the logistics warehouse going through to our what we call the the light duty bays not necessarily this is only light duty but uh these are a little bit smaller bays so we can't necessarily be working on you know an engine or a tower or a tender in this bay uh, right now matt west is working on idt2 uh, we're putting a uh, Wabasto fuel heater or sorry compartment heater that uses diesel fuel so he's got the fuel tank out of it on that side we have uh, medic 17 doing a, a service on it as you can see things get a little bit cramped in here uh, they have one set of lifts so they have to be very um, strategic and where they place the lifts and what kind of vehicles they're working on. As you can see over here, Matt West's toolbox uh, is right up against the lifts, so uh, he needs to plan around that. All right, so uh, <clears throat> I'm working on IDT2 right now. Uh, we're doing some upgrades to it. Uh, the problem is it sits outside all the time and the compartments get rather cold. And there's a lot of batteries uh, for hand radios and drones um, and other items like that that we can't let freeze. So we're putting in a Wabasto diesel heater uh, to run automatically when it's parked outside. Um, so right now I have the fuel tank dropped down and I'm plumbing in the auxiliary fuel line here. Um, so this is the auxiliary fuel line that goes up to the pump up here that I've already installed. There's a, a filter and a pump, and it's all self-contained up there. And then uh, the actual heater itself is inside this side compartment here, and you can see it from this side over here. It's a really small unit, and you have your air intake on this side, and then the hot air is expelled into the compartment, um, which is a sealed compartment underneath. And then I have vents ran to, to various places in the truck to keep it nice and warm. And then it has a digital thermostat. So this is the last step of plumbing up the system before I button everything back up and uh, test it out. Um, here, and here's the new exhaust system for it. So uh, I'll just go ahead and tighten these up and should be good to go. We can, lift, we can lift a pumper out here if we need to. It's just so tight that we can't really tilt the cab or anything like that. Uh, but these lifts are capable of lifting almost any apparatus that we have, which is nice. Um, and these are brand new. They're about a year old now, I guess. Um, and they're wireless, battery powered, and uh, very safe to work under. They use an elevator style lock, which is a wedge lock. So if if the system were to fail, they would automatically lock in place um, to prevent you from getting crushed, which would be terrible. <laughs> I'm just rotating the tank now to go clear the exhaust pipe. Good morning, Norb. Making sure nothing gets pinched or broken. It's very expensive. <laughs> Check it, make sure everything's clear. And then I'll uh, start to bolt it up to the frame. Once I get it bolted up, I'll install my uh, fuel fill hose here, which I had to remove to drop the tank. And then I'll uh, go ahead and prime the new heater and purge the air out of the lines and make sure everything works great. So this is the older style um, yellow graphics that we were using on the, on the apparatus. And we found that um, some of it is actually not as reflective as you would think. And so we moved to this uh, gold leaf style.
very reflective uh, graphics. And then these are some of the different greens that we were vetting out on our uh, safety rigs to make them distinguishable on, on the fire scene. Uh, we ended up going with a color kind of between these two. I also do all the programming for the lighting here. So this is the Wayland program I'm working on for Red 3. So this is kind of a slow, calm flash pattern you can see here that will run uh, at the airport so that the, um, the pilots and the tower aren't too distracted um, from the lighting. And then when we're on the road responding, um, unlike most ARFs, we actually run ours on the road. We have a more aggressive flash pattern to match our other apparatus. Um, and then these are um, action, this is an action flash, flash pattern. And it's kind of a random flash pattern. But this kind of shows you um, some of the different outputs that we have on the system. Um, so there's quite a bit. And then we also have uh, an expansion module with more outputs for the rear of the vehicle. Um, and we can actually light up individually the red and the blue side of the light and flash them independently of each other. Um, and we have a lot more capability. Um, and then I also have a, a mock-up system up here. This is a sound off system. And I use this to, flat, or to test different flash patterns and programming before we um, implement it, you know, on the actual vehicles up on the line. So we have, uh, you know, different different flash patterns, and we can we can play around with things. Also have a radio set up here. We can listen to the radio, make sure uh, antenna installations, things like that, work properly out on the in the field. So there we have four technicians in-house that are what we call triple masters. So they have three master certifications. Um, those are ambulance, fire apparatus, and ARF. Um, so an emergency vehicle technician uh, has been certified to work on not just the truck side of things as maybe a normal technician or mechanic would be able to, but the fire specific, such as the aerial, the pumps, um, you know, the medical side of the medics, and uh, ARF vehicles. Hi, my name's Tom. I'm EVT here at South Metro. Uh, in the shop today we have uh, 3367. It is our uh, reserve straight stick aerial and it's in for maintenance. And uh, when these trucks come in for maintenance, we're responsible as a technician, basically bumper to bumper. We have uh, kind of like a rigorous checklist we kind of go through to make sure these trucks are tip top for these guys. Make sure they're safe for not only daily operation, but fire operation, uh, driving on the street, they have to meet DOT regulation as well as NFPA regulations. So, and so what we have going on today, um, during our during my inspection, I found the front suspension was cracked. But what happens when that suspension is under that truck, just age and um, use of the truck, that suspension starts to move around, bolts come loose, and it's our job to find that. Make sure this truck's safe. Make sure it's in spec. So during my inspection, kind of hard to see here. There's a crack that runs all the way through this weld, comes up, and then back down through this weld, and it goes through the backside. So I mean that looks like a small crack for such a big truck, but that small crack can take this truck out of service. Um, this truck goes, uh, undergoes a what's called a UL inspection. I believe it's every five years this truck has to pass an inspection through the UL uh, underwriting labs uh, standards and NFPA standards. This is one of those things they check for. So this is a weld on the suspension, but they also check all the welds on the, on the aerial ladder, um, all the welds on the frame, all the bolts on the frame. They even check all the torque on the bolts on the frame. And Unfortunately, that is the out-of-service criteria for this truck. So here I am replacing it. We got, we got them both done. Still in process a little bit on the other side. We're tightening some bolts back up. But it, uh, it's a job. <laughs> so I'd say my favorite truck would have to be uh, these aerials, these ladder trucks. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on. You know, yeah, because all of our trucks have water pumps on them. All of our ladder trucks do, which is not necessarily common in all over the all over the United States in our fire service in the fire service. But I mean, you're you're running everything from 
doing turbochargers, doing ladder work. You're, you're, we, uh, we have to adjust the cables. Um, you're working on your front suspension, your rear suspension. It's basically, basically a one-stop shop. You want to get some experience on a fire truck? Working on a ladder truck. Uh, to get here, um, it's preferable to have uh, either an associate's degree in diesel technology or uh, at least five years of heavy duty experience. Uh, we don't require any kind of um, you know, previous, previous experience working on fire apparatus. We do a lot of in-house training to get up to that level. Uh, but with that five years of experience, it kind of gives you that core knowledge to be able to come here and work as a journeyman level technician. All right, so if you guys look over here, we have Lance and Steve. They're actually uh, getting ready to rip this door off this truck. And just like everything, everything wears out. And we actually got to replace the door hinge on this truck. Just tight. And that involves lifting the door with the crane. You guys look, we have the big crane. Okay. And uh, it's kind of a two-man job sometimes because you have to make sure you, don't da make sure you don't damage anything and take it apart. So we worked on everything, bumper to bumper, on these trucks. So if you look, you just get access to that hinge, what he's got to do, we have to pull the whole door panel off. We have to go in there and remove all the wiring that goes through the cab uh, hinge. Uh, basically that operates your window, your power mirror, um, your power lock. So all that, all that stuff's got to come off. And the hinge is not even that big of a part, but there's a lot, there's a lot to do to get to that hinge. Look back over here, Lance's got the door off and getting to that hinge. So everybody's heard of the, the Black Pearl, well here's Fleet's Mini Pearl. It's our golf cart we use to uh, drive around the shop here, drive around the, the property, get back down to the pump pit when we pump our trucks. We go around it to get parts just around the property here. And it's just uh, a fun little fun little shop project we have. It was actually uh, over at Mythtick's training, training grounds where I think one of the academies gave it Quite a nice paint job, and some decal work. It has uh, lights and sirens. It's a little obnoxious, so we don't we, we uh, took the sirens off, but it's not bad. It's pretty fun to drive around. Coolest golf cart South Metro owns. Here's uh, Red One. Uh, we actually just put a new engine in this one. We're getting ready to fire it up here in the next couple of days. Uh, and we'll be doing some annual testing and maintenance on it. All right, so this is a two-stroke Detroit diesel. It's an 8V92, very, kind of one of our more unique engines in this department. This engine needs to be very common in the fire service, but it's slowly being, uh, I would say, pushed out by the emissions requirements of today's standards. And um, we have a couple of these trucks left with our with these two-stroke Detroits. Both of our, our big ARF trucks have this, this engine in it. We also have the dive rig with basically the same engine. I think it's a six cylinder in that one. But this engine actually has a turbocharger and a supercharger under here. It's got an enormous radiator to keep this thing cool. What we're doing here is we're actually gonna go ahead and lift Tender 40. This is a big truck, it's full of water. And Brady over here, Michael, is actually gonna do the service on this truck. So we're actually lucky to have these Coney lifts here in our shop. And these lifts actually allow us to lift entire trucks off the ground. It's to do service. It's, it's really nice. You see that in car shops all the time with your car lifted up in the air. Well, well we can lift fire trucks here. It's pretty impressive. And take the, we actually have six of these on this truck. It takes this little chip. And you go around and you actually connect each one of these lifts together via Bluetooth. And basically, you can lift it with the touch of a button.
So the weight of this truck, you know, it's pretty pretty massive. It's probably 60,000 pounds. Um, but each one of these columns is rated for 18,000 pounds, 18,500. So we're plenty safe under here. We have six columns under this truck, so it doesn't doesn't go anywhere. And we're back on those locks. Every single one of these lo of these lifts have a lock on them, and this truck's not going to move unless we move it. I think it's everybody, every little boy's dream. I mean, I get to drive drive fire trucks and work on them and play with them all day long. That's that was one of the uh, my it still is my favorite part of the job. Yeah. So I started. Uh, I came into this with no. Uh, previous fire experience. Um, I had no a ASE tests, no EVT tests. Uh, I received my third master certification, master EVT certification within three years of working here. Um, and just kind of, you know, paying attention to how this department works and the needs of the department. Um, I really feel like, you know, my core values align with that, just trying to bring you know, fleet is considered support services. So we're here to support the department and whatever they need. So, I mean, if, if we're called out, you know, for snow plowing, we're gonna be there. And just having kind of that, that core knowledge, that fundamental of uh, teamwork and trying to, you know, help the department as best we can has really uh, helped me um, move up the ranks. This is a kind of a special thing that fleet does for the department during uh, big snowstorms when uh, the snow is just kind of too deep for these trucks to, to move around, these medics can't get out. We actually will we actually put one of us in, in these plows and they'll spread us through the district. We have five plows and we'll actually respond out as an apparatus um, to assist where, where needed, basically. They'll, they'll dispatch us out, they'll add us to calls, or sometimes we're plowing in medics, plow, plowing uh, the medic into the patient's home or wherever that patient's located. We'll plow them in, make sure they can get out but we had, I had, there was one call where I actually had to plow um, both the engine and the medic in to a sick patient. We had probably two feet of snow on the ground. The engine was able to go up ahead of me and turn around, and then I actually stayed back and I plowed the street so the medic could get in all the way to the, to the main street where the entrance to the neighborhood was. And then I came back to the residence and actually shoveled from the back of the ambulance all the way to the front door of the residence to uh, allow them access with their pram to get that sick patient out. Hey, I'm uh, Nick Myers. I'm one of the emergency vehicle technicians here. Uh, what I'm going to show you today is a type 6 brush truck and uh, what I've got going on here is a pump failure. So um, the operators, they took it out and they complained that there was water dripping out from the pump. Um, I've already taken it apart so I'll show you kind of what it looks like the insides of the rest of the pump. Um, this is kind of a, a, it's actually a really small pump. Um, it's only rated at 400 uh, PSI and um, it's run basically off of a lawnmower motor something you'd find at your house uh, and on your lawnmower and stuff like that but it uh, pumps out enough uh, pressure to put out wildland fires uh, and stuff like that and that's that's what's intended for but uh, what I ended up having to do is the engine side and then there's a pump side that we'll show you inside and uh, if you want to take a quick look inside um, it's basically just two gears and a pump and um, uh, we'll show you the other side when we get inside this is the other side of the pump. Um, you saw half of it outside and this is the other half in here. And uh, basically um, this gear is driven off the other big gear that you saw outside uh, in which turns the impeller. And this little impeller here is what does all the work and flows all the water. So um, like I said outside there was a leak and um, the leak was coming from this little groove right here. And what's happened uh, once we tore it down and looked you can see the water um, over the years has just corroded away this pump body. So it's, uh, it's taken out this pump body and then also taken out the, what we call the mechanical seal. The seal uh, rides in here. It actually moves with the impeller and that's how it seals. But uh, it took that out and so now what I've done is uh, took it apart and we've gone to our manufacturers. This is the parts diagram here. Um, and this is what we do with our parts department. We, break down what we need, we bring it to them, and they, uh, they'll go ahead and order all the parts. So we're about a week out on the parts. Uh, the, unfortunately, it's gonna be out for about a week, but we'll get the parts in, get it back together, and get it back on the road. Uh, I would say in this industry as a whole, absolutely, there's a, a, a big um, risk of injury. You know, if you're not paying attention or, 
you know, just a, a minor lapse in judgment can cause some long lasting injuries. All right, so what we have, all right, so what we have here is our welding fabrication department. Um, we try to do all of our small repairs um, with the uh, apparatus. Sometimes the, uh, the steps will break, sometimes some of the pieces underneath will break that mount, mount the pump panels together. And so what they're fixing over here now is actually a, a step for a medic. And they're actually doing a little bit of training as well. These, some of the newer guys are trying to learn how to do that fabrication and welding. So they'll actually uh, pull the pieces off the trucks, prep them, and repair them in-house get those trucks back out sooner. All right, so here we are on Tower 32, kind of up inside here, and we have Logan working on this truck. So Logan, during his PM inspection, found a leaking water manifold on this truck. And so if you know, this truck is equipped with that, that big pump, and it's gotta be watertight for these guys to, to actually uh, operate it. So you look, this big water manifold sits right there, and all your discharges come off that. So all the discharges that the engineer control from his control panel, these are the valves he's controlling. And th that, you know, that, that holds all your pump pressure. And it was actually cracked down inside here behind the pump panel. They need everything from light bulbs, pump repairs, ladder repairs. We take care of it here in house. And South Metro helps us buy our tools in our toolbox. They give us $1,000 a year as part of a benefit here at South Metro being an EVT. And that, that actually equates to a lot of tools broken out through. Um, these tools are, there's really no brand specific. We, we buy what we can afford and what, what makes sense to get the job done. So on average, an EVT will spend about five to $6,000 in tools just to keep up with the demand of the, the, these new trucks coming out. Yeah, as far as I know, it's pretty common in my field where uh, technicians will supply their own tools to work at shops. It's a big investment, but that big investment you carry with you throughout your entire career and you can take them home. I can fix my own trucks on the side. I mean, I can, my truck's never been into a shop. I can just, they're very val. it's a very valuable investment. So kind of the unspoken rule around here anyways is uh, if you borrow it twice, you should probably buy it. And that's, uh, and there's a lot of tools I've borrowed more than twice and I still haven't bought. So I have quite the list growing that one day I'll have that big master set of tools where we come, everybody will come to me and borrow those tools. And I can say that back to them. But these guys that have been here 20 years have tools that they don't even make anymore that are hard to find and they get the job done. Or sometimes we'll have to make custom tools. So part of our job is being problem solvers and sometimes not having that tool, you guys gotta adapt and overcome and get the job done. Make sure it's done correctly and sometimes that correct tool is not always available. We've had to make tools to press in seals. We've had to make tools to press in bearings, make tools to take suspension apart, but get the job done and make sure that truck's back out serving the community. Uh, I would say a lot of people are surprised that uh, uh, fleet services exist within the fire department. Um, uh, we get asked all the time, well, I didn't think fire trucks broke. Why, why do they need you guys? Well, fire trucks break, they break a lot. Yeah, and uh, kind of our unofficial fleet slogan is without us, they walk. So yeah, it's, we take uh, a lot of pride in what we do um, here, knowing that we, we support that, you know, we are, we are the transportation to the call. We are, you know, the ones that make sure that when they get in that truck, that it is good to go down the road to an emergency call.